clemency architecture was my design and doing. So a lot of that also applies for some of the patching work and some of the other stuff that you guys will see. Yeah, she's the one to blame for all your late night headaches during DEF CON for the past like five years. Anyways, so anyways. <clears throat> so why we came up with patchwork or why we had the idea is because it seems like invariably on every research project that we have, every piece of hardware or software that we touch, we have to instrument it somehow. We need to research it. We need to either find out how vulnerable it is or we need some way to patch the functionality to modify its behavior. And it seems like over and over, we reinvent this process again and again and again for every binary type we had. So um, when we were studying some, um, yes, get that nice and close. So while we're studying uh, IoT type devices, and we have a variety of them that we're looking into, um, this was just not going to work if we had to reinvent this for every single device type and stuff. And so uh, if any of you got to see Parker Thompson's and, and the CITL groups talk yesterday, they pretty much did our background for us. That was an amazing talk on just the statistics of even just a small space of, of the vendors in the IoT market, and it's only growing and getting bigger, right? So we need to have tools that are going to enable us to be able to instrument or research in a, in a custom way um, the security profiles of these IoT devices. Uh, the IoT devices that we're familiar with obviously are all of our routers, our camera devices, even mobile platforms. Uh, vehicle platforms are now becoming the IoT. In the future we're going to have our refrigerators talking to us. We have Alexa and all those other devices. But why we mention uh, specifically Battelle and what we do as a science research foundation is because we also have access to other IoT type devices like medical devices. Um, you know, the biggest thing in the news with the hospital space and security was WannaCry and SamSam, those hijacked ransomware viruses, and how they come into a hospital system and take over patient records is not through the front doors, not even through the DMZ, it's not through the web interfaces. It's, uh, if you look at the percentages, it's largely through the IoT medical devices that are in patient rooms. They're the nurse call stations, they're the patient monitoring systems. And so our view of IoT can't just be, here's an inexpensive consumer-based device, even though that affects a large number of people, but increasingly important targets like hospitals and medical device space, we also need to be able to patch, uh, assess the vulnerability or the security profile of these type devices. The problem that we have, though, is that in the life cycle of a device like this, um, Many times, they start with a, an open source kernel base um, that may not even be the latest revision. So there may already be CVEs available or that are uh, against the type of kernels that they're putting in to start off with, right? And from then on, you have customizations. When in our REVR work, typically the most vulnerable places or the, the security profiles that are the weakest are all on the vendor add-ons. You have a custom SOC chip or you know, a Wi-Fi chipset or, or some other piece of hardware that's not in the kernel tree that they want to customize or hide for their own proprietary uh, means. And the problem is, is they introduce a lot of uh, vulnerable paths through those kind of devices and those kind of drivers, right? Um, these devices that are, are made are usually not even made by the company themselves. They're made by some third party that may or may not configure all the hardware or the software to their spec. Uh, so we can't even guarantee that the images that we want get placed on there. They're rebranded and sold by yet another company. When we as administrators put them on our networks, we install them somewhere, we have to figure out, you know, is this going to be in our DMZ? Is this going to be external? Are we going to create our own segregated network for our IoT devices? Or is it just going to live in a trusted environment? then we configure them in some way that may or may not be to the specs or the intended use of the product. So we may be introducing vulnerabilities that way. We have the maintenance and upgrade cycle. So we're largely dependent on these vendors 
to either open source their kernel so that we can assess the security profile of this device, or that they're releasing regular binary patches in an update system for their device so that we can keep it up to date with the latest patches. Right? And then eventually, these end of life, and there's a wide variety of professional level to consumer grade appliances that are now in our networks. They're all over the place. And uh, especially if you've got an inexpensive turnaround manufacturer that just wants you know, to, to quickly sell these units, they're going to sell these units and within two years have an end of life so that they can sell the next unit that's the exact same but with a different number. Right? That's their product and there's a monetization model. Right? So we have valuable pieces of gear, very, very adequate pieces of gear, but now they're no longer being supported by the vendors at all. So getting patches or getting security updates to these devices are going to be a problem. Um, some of the ways that we can try to um, do this ourselves is we can either try to get the um, code base ourselves and try to patch. Um, that can be, if any of you have dealt with some of these IoT devices, can be weeks of configuration and nightmare of pulling out your hair to try even get these things to compile with the right tool chains. I mean, you could even be Lenaro versus, you know, new ABI, different type, you know, different versions, 4.9 versus 5.1 tool chain, and the different tool chains will compile the source in an incompatible manner. So there's just so many variables in trying to get this to run, plus a lot of vendors um, we've noticed in our space while they will release the, you know, good public bits, a lot of their, you know, chipset specific or proprietary type stuff, they won't release. So you're never going to get a kernel that will properly compile with their drivers. Um, some companies have gone to the model of, hey, looking forward, if we're going to the future, what's a way that we can keep our devices running but be able to patch them? So live patching or dynamic software updates, we have a bunch of different companies that have tried to put together a, a model or a, propose a standard technology in which to patch our devices. Oracle, Red Hat, SUS, you know, we have these different products. Uh, the problem again is, is it's a very fractured space. It only works on their uh, proprietary operating system or their flavor of operating system. Uh, the 4.0 Linux Kernel is trying to integrate all these technologies that these companies have created and roll it into something called Live Patch. So while you have a, the patching capability, um, it's, this is in the future, and most devices that we've seen haven't even adopted the 4.x kernel, right? So we're still on mostly, hopefully, the devices we're seeing are all on the 3 variant, but there's still some 2.x stuff out there, right? So in general, this kind of stuff is, this kind of approach is not going to work for our, our approach. You're going to have to have the source anyway. You're going to have to be able to diff that source. You're going to have to be able to patch it. Most of these systems work on, uh, you know, having accurate source and being able to accurately diff the bytes so that they know how to patch that in. Um, you could have kernel loadable modules enabled. You could have uh, any one of these technologies, but now you've got another point to yet to secure because now you've got a live dynamic patching environment. Your attackers now have a live dynamic patching environment for themselves too, right? So if we can't look to the future for the way that we should go or the future is kind of unclear as far as what is that going to look like, why don't we head back to the past maybe 20 years or so ago? I love these guys. I love the, I love the technology. I love reading these magazines. Uh, especially magazines like Frack, because the people who contributed to it really knew what they were doing. And there's a lot of sophistication in a lot of what they did. Um, back about 98, 99 time frame, 20 years ago, we learned about the joys of Dev KMEM. In the 2.x kernel, by default, it was enabled. And this is a static view of your kernel memory. And so what... Um, anybody who had root privileges could do would be to inspect dev kmem on a read and write basis and they had your entire kernel space laid out so while you might not be able to execute as kernel privilege in user space if you can write into dev kmem you have complete access to 
the layout and the code that's there, right? And there was very little in the ways of protections or validating what went in or out of this piping mechanism. I say all that to say that they, you know, they've taken that away for the most part. It is an option in the kernels, but by default, nobody turns that thing on for good reason. But the techniques that these people developed back in the day, Silvio, uh, you know, Davik, you know, all these SD, I keep saying these names just in case somebody out in the audience chuckles and says, yeah, that was me. <laughs> um, th these people really outlined some of the techniques that we're going to use because what we have is we have a static view of dev kmem. We now are in a position where we can take a static kernel off of an IoT device, have it laid out in front of us, we can patch it any way we want to, and then put it right back on the device, because we own the device, we have physical access to it. Now, different devices are obviously going to protect it in very different ways. Um, there, there may be some you know, headers on the board that you're able to extract some of this through JTAG or whatever. Um, some of these even just have a you know, serial console that is available for you to upload, download, whatever you want. Some of them are fairly protected. So hopefully um, that is beyond the scope of this talk, but if you are able to pull these off, which we are on a great many devices that we look at and work with, and are able to put that back on either through your own method or through an update mechanism that exists on the device, then we can employ the same kind of KMEM ideas that they had. They, they would look for structures in the VM Linux, specifically stuff like the KAL sims that we know now, which tells you where the functions are and what addresses that those functions reside at. Uh, they're the, you know, the public functions discoverable for loadable modules or whatever else. So we can find those same kind of structures. They would take an approach on this dev KMEM where they would patch in like the syscall table. That's how they would gain entry into a kernel space. So um, we're not going to hook the syscall table, although we definitely could. We're going to allow you to hook anywhere you want in the kernel space itself. But typically how they would do that is they would want to um, call in using some sort of user method from, from the root. So if we just take, this is just a uh, representative VM Linux. It may not be your VM Linux at home. But if we just take a general look at VM Linux here and its layout, the file is going to be laid out like this on the disk statically. And the nice thing is, is it's not, the pieces are not broken up. So we know exactly where the offsets are going to be. So all we have to do in our uh, standpoint, say we want to hook a function U random. We want to control U random's behavior and not let it be random because we have some behavior that we need to be um, consistent and observable and testable. So we could hook U random, and then what we're going to have to do is find we want U random still to run, and there's very little space in U random's actual read function. So we only have real space to just execute a hook. That hook is going to branch off into where we want to patch and put our code. So what we're going to have to do, and part of the non-silver bullet method of ours, of our approach is, you're still going to have to open up binary ninja on this, right? You're still going to have to discover an RE a bit of the space of, of the VM Linux process to find out where you want to place your code. But the code, the patch location could be drivers they have a lot of debug information usually in them. Another great place to put it is panic. I mean, if your kernel is going to go down in a fiery ball and you're just overriding panic, what does it matter if it goes down gracefully or not? So you could overwrite panic, right? So there's a lot of different ways or a lot of different places where you can put your code. The one thing that we don't have that they had with DevKMEM is they had access to dynamic memory so they could allocate their own pages in memory and not have to stomp over stuff in a large manner. Unfortunately, since we're static, we're going to have to uh, at least put our hooks in our initial uh, memory accesses. We're going to have to put them somewhere. So we would recommend that you would find some suitable location, find the function you want to hook, say it's um, uRandom. It's just basically going to be a branch call. We're going to call down into our patch location. We could hook this before it executes. We could hook this after it executes. So we could bounds check any kind of parameters coming into the vulnerable function 
and fix it that way before it even gets to the function. Or at the end, we could bounce check it or modify the result that's coming back from the function if that's our desired behavior. After we run, we're going to return back and we're going to run the, you know, the opcodes that we replaced in the branch and let it continue on. So really, there's nothing really complex to what we're doing. That's just the real simple model of how we're doing it. But what we've done is we've put together this whole system so, and we've got the repos up on GitHub for you all so that you can either use our product or you can use it for your own research. So when we're putting together a patch, we have a lot of different options. Um, a lot of people choose to work in assembly. They're pretty versed in it stuff, but I usually tend to um, like C or some other manageable language. I don't like to uh, calculate all those offsets myself. In particular, our system that we're talking about today as it's released is focused on the ARM64 architecture for Linux. Uh, we've built it so that it can be extensible to the other, you know, the MIPS platform that we saw yesterday, how pervasive that is, ARM, x86, et cetera. But we're going to be focusing on um, ARM64. So what we could do is we could use, you know, good tools like Keystone or Binary Ninja or any one of them to assemble the code that we want to, but we're still left with a lot of hand uh, manipulation here of you know, how do we do all of our offsets? ADR, ADRP, branch instructions, at least in the 64-bit uh, ARM realm, require knowing exactly which opcode or which address you're at at the time that you call that function. So you could either patch it with some sort of blank opcode and then go back with uh, some script, Python or whatever, and touch all that up yourselves. Or we could just use new. We already have a whole compiler tool chain that does exactly what we want. We have GCC, which will compile all our code into binary relocatable code from C. And then we have LD that's going to be able to put all that together and stitch all that together. It was built to do all the relocations for us. So we can just say where our address is going to be and just let LD do its job. So we've put that together in our environment. Our patching steps for the patchwork system look like this. First, we're going to locate the KL sims in the binary. Again, the KL sims is your symbol table for uh, the functions that are exported by the kernel and their address offset in that particular file. Um, if we don't discover the, the KL sims, and I'll show you here in a second how we look for that, uh, we could also instrument to take our own KL sims running off the device. So all you'd have to do is get onto the device in a running state, cat out that proc KL sims if you have access to that. Uh, you'd have to find the base address of that, of where that kernel was running at and minus that, subtract that from the KL sims address and then you would have the offsets in that static file that we could use just the same. So we dynamically, or we, we statically an analyze the VM Linux. We're pretty good at pulling that off um, ourselves. Then we're going to compile our patch. We're going to compile in. We have some macros again, hook before, hook after, uh, allow you to put some macros in your C code to define how you want that behavior to be. That will create some intermediate binary objects. We have a loader script that we, that we assemble from all those binary pieces so that we can stitch together things that should be together so it's all compact into one nice little patch code. Uh, then we link that into the binary output and write that down into the kernel. So for our KL sims, there's a lot of different ways to look at KL sims and there's a lot of good scripts out there. Uh, the 64-bit stuff in our uh, some of the devices that we looked at didn't quite work, so we adopted a different uh, KL Sims Hunter. Uh, right now, we're looking for um, a number to be written at a 256 byte boundary, that number being somewhere between 10,000 and 500,000. And that's just the typical range that we're estimating of numbers of symbols that a typical VM Linux image will export, a typical kernel will export. Then that should be padded with zeros for the next, you know, whatever's remaining of that 256 byte boundary. The next 256 byte boundary is going to start our compressed symbol table. These are going to be in Pascal format. Um, if you don't know what Pascal format is, the first byte tells you the length and the next 
length number of bytes are going to be indexes down into a symbol table later. So if we find this behavior, if we find this number and we find this Pascal delimited table, we just count the numbers of entries in that table and see if they match up. If we do, we're pretty good and we're pretty confident that we have the KL sims. Um, from that also we can get all the addresses, we can reconstruct all the names, we can spit all the KL sims out too. So even if KL sims is all you want, we have a flag that will analyze an image and just spit out the KL sims for it and just exit. So uh, you don't even need to fully patch if you just want to inspect it. Uh, the other magic bit that, uh, that Jewel put together uh, with all the system that she's uh, created, this myloader.lds, it's a dynamically generated loader script and that's really where the magic of how all this stuff comes together works. So we can compile this into normal .o. Um, we're using just any representative code. I should, I, should, I should state that up front. You don't need the vendor source to compile this patch. You can use any kernel source. The closer the kernel source is to the actual kernel that was developed and, and the vendor kernel that you have, the better because all your structures are going to match, right? Um, but the compiler doesn't need any of that. It's just going to compile into relocatable code. The loader that gets generated by the create linker script puts all these together. And if you're not familiar with how loader scripts operate in this loader script language, it's very, very powerful. It allows you to relocate all these sections that are normally lo you know, located in a file at certain boundaries and offsets. You can pack them all together. So up at the top, you can see change memory common or print K if we're calling print K. This is where those KL sims gets patched into this file. And this tells the, the loader where to relocate those functions. So that's really where the magic of those happen. Uh, our sections section will tell you how this is um, laid out. So we can start it at a specific address, in this case, uh, hex 52700 is the function that we wish to overwrite. We're going to put in all of our text and data together so that we know where all of our strings and all of our data structures are. Uh, creates a nice tight little patch unit. Uh, and then any of our hooks, we can also specify uh, where, where that code is being manipulated. So you'll see some more of that in the demo. Jewel will work, walk through some of that. Uh, but it is truly that's where the magic of a lot of this happens. And hopefully you can take our system and look at how we're doing things to learn how to make and roll your own uh, loader file. Um, I want to go back and it reiterate uh, we're not a silver bullet. You can't just use our tool to patch every CVE that's out there. Um, you're going to have to do some research with, a, with the CVE or the patch diffs yourself. You're going to have to look at the vendor source or, or the source that is closest that you can come and actually patch it yourself and create, create your own C files that are going to patch this. Um, case in point, say we want to instrument um, the Broadcom 43XX chip and we have this chipset structure and we wish to enumerate all the different um, uh, devices that are currently serviced by this chipset. Um, right here is kind of the structure that we want to address in our, in, our, in our patch function. This is what we want to go after. And if we're just using source and using the B43WL, the problem comes is, is this structure has a whole bunch of stuff laid into it and we have a config block. This is really where you need to know either the vendor's config source, you know, and, and know what options were conf uh, compiled in there. Because if this hardware random number generator is actually compiled into your chipset or supported by your chipset, then it's going to have these structures in that structure, making the offset to your dev list further on down, right? So your compiler is going to compile it in the wrong space if you don't have these. So what we'd suggest is, again, open up Binary Ninja or your favorite uh, disassembler, take a look at a representative driver that already uses this B43WL structure located in memory and try to see if you can identify, do some RE to identify if this config option is compiled in or not. This is just one of many examples that we've run into of, hey, you know, this is going to take a little bit of work to make happen. Uh, our demo right now, what we're going to show you is a build, bo um, a build box um, 
environment. We've just created a kernel, a dummy kernel. We're going to use QMU and, oh my goodness, blank screen, sorry, that was the B. Um, we're going to use QMU to run all these demos and just kind of show you exactly what's going to happen in the patching. So Patchwork itself is mainly a bunch of Python scripts that go through and run uh, GCC on a kernel itself. Um, so for an example, Parker mentioned about doing urandom. So here's a C file doing calls hook after and says I'm going to patch the urandom read function, which is found in the KL sims table. Any function that we do a hook on, we have a, all the registers that get passed in. So we have access to modify registers that get passed for parameters. We can see what the current parameters are. We can change return values. In this case, we're going to go get the current PID. We're going to print out some information about it. We're going to go fill up the buffer with a pattern and send it back out. All those other files in here, most of them actually end up being created by the actual script itself. So just to show. Makefile is purely just importing our internal make. Whitelist is saying what we're going to actually put the, the program into. So in this case, we aren't using um, IPv6, so we're going to overwrite the INET6 area because that's a free area I can use right now. So image is the original image itself. Oops. So the original is showing that it's very random. I don't have anything useful here. Compile patch is just running my Python script with extra parameters on it, so I can tell to do the test itself. So go through, compiled it up, uh, created the scripts and such in the actual patches folder. So if I run my modified one, Notice I actually have output from the kernel saying what was going on was passed in. I'm showing that my patch code was actually executed and given the pattern. <laughs> well, this can actually allow for other useful and interesting things. Um, you can actually modify output and modify results. So if I do like TTY, So I have a both hook before and hook after. So if I run data to the TTY output and I modify how much data is going out, I need to be able to pass the modified buffer to the actual TTY buffer code. But if, I re if that code returns back saying that you told me to write five bytes and I actually only wrote eight, then functions that call it from user land are going to have a problem. And this actually causes issues. So I need to actually return back and say, no, I actually only did five bytes and I'm lying on the result. So in this case, I end up using an extra argument to say, 
destroy my result and put it back, well, down in the code, I go and sort it off so I can actually control it. Well, that being simple enough, obviously the file itself, I mean, looking at the hex, it's not temple OS in the actual hex itself. I don't have enough characters to store all that string, but I modify the output. And this actually causes some interesting results. So if I do, <laughs> but I can't cat it because that actual file doesn't exist. It does cause trouble. <laughs> Didn't I have my bash history? Oh. Apparently, I supposedly echoed high temple OS also. So I'm f I have full control of the TTY output and showing that you can actually modify things going in and out and have control of all the data. So, how can this be useful? So, well, we actually have. In the environment, oops, else by type right, custom driver. So, so the custom driver will take in the password. It writes data out. It's a bunch of garbage. and get the result back. But the driver itself has a bug, so if I give it too much data, or what it thinks is too much data into the buffer itself, oh, also I run the actual original image. I can kernel panic the system. However, this is show, so the actual code is using references over to my build root folder. I just want to show that I don't have the actual Battel driver anywhere in the actual kernel source, which will take a moment. It's actually all that runs. Patches. Mod. Patch. So I'm going to do a hook on the right, which actually check the result. If the length is more than 512 bytes, I'm going to tell that I want to return the, an error, and don't run the original function. So I won't call the original if I have a return of negative one from my hack, from the actual hook code. Same on being able to read data, and also on validating actual structure information, because another bug in the structure is it doesn't validate that the state is valid. So go through, make sure everything's proper, and if my state is too large, error out. Otherwise, everything's going to run the original code. Let's go. It's taking longer than I want. We've been under drivers. Miscellaneous. Going to show up. Recursive. 
I don't have the driver itself in the kernel. Patchwork. Uh, demo mod. Run the modified image. So it still works there. I can't write enough data to the file itself to actually cause a crash though. Because the patch itself is avoiding the original code running under bad information. This can also be used for debugging and learning other things going on. So if I do, um, The copy of code I have on my system, Parker doesn't have. Smaller than state size. So now I'm outputting the information itself about the actual parameters being passed in. Oh, it should have been the plus four. Because there's more than states in that. So the patches not only allow for doing patching vulnerabilities and patching the data going in and out, you can write code for debugging and testing and seeing what others going on. So if you're looking at, you're trying to version engineer some custom driver, you're trying to understand some piece of custom hardware, you're able to hook, as long as symbols are in KL sims, you can hook those functions and see what's being passed into them and what's going on with them. Do you have anything else to be shown there? Should you go over? If you want to look at a, you know, a loader script. I can do that. Something like your U random or one. Okay. Um. So in this case, um, when it compiled, once the object files are compiled, we go through and find all of the required functions. We then go and pull those functions out of KLSIMS, so we found these addresses for these three functions. We also know that the area of the kernel that the whitelist says we can overwrite starts here. And we actually start filling in box information so that when the linker is told, link everything together, it actually outputs a binary with all the offsets and all of the relative accesses correct for these memory locations where we're going to force the code into. So we actually ended up with a very small 
patch of data for all that information. So demo mod.bin ends up being the full patch itself. We then end up taking, um, oops. We have a map file that then allows us to know the output from the linker and such. Here's where we need to go shove how much data into different areas of the kernel itself so that we then have full control of what we're patching and where it's going to get hooked to and how it gets handled. So in this case, you can see that we're going to go find hook before the Battelle module IOCTL. Here's the address. Here's how many bytes in the length. We have a global descriptor table in, with a pointer in of some form because it's eight bytes long. The write address, the read address. If I did the same for like the TTY one, You can see I have both the hook before and the hook after, and it's, those are actually parts that have been used by the Python script to know what type of patches to apply for the actual handling of it. So, I don't have anything else. <clears throat> I also did want to kind of uh, trip you through some of this. We do have, uh, uh, you'll see here on the next slide, we do have an architectures. So we've already, we've already designed this uh, to take more architectures in than we've currently uh, implemented. If you look at the architectures, we have an ARCH64 and stuff that you'll see in stuff like that is we have a bunch of our patches and our patch fix-ups. If you want to take a look through that, that's really where a lot of this magic happens of our, of our stub loaders and stuff like that, how you patch before, patch after, makes those registers available, the, the arguments available in your code and the return values, all that's happening in these patch fix-ups. So that's per uh, architecture specific. So if we're going to implement this in MIPS or ARM or whatever, we would have to rewrite these patches to make the appropriate register sets and return sets and the calling conventions proper for those architectures. So I just kind of wanted to give you a little, uh, little glimpse into some of the some of the architectural bits here in hopes, wink, wink, that you uh, extend these architectures. One of the nice things is because the architectures is right there, handling something like x86 that requires all types of memory accesses in different instruction sizes, we're not trying to do the actual parsing of the information on during execution, all that can occur during the actual compilation. So if a complex script is required to parse up and figure out what instructions got overwritten or need to be moved around, this is fully doable because it's not going to impact actual execution speed, it only impacts how long it takes to compile. So what's next for our tool? Right now, like we've said before, we have uh, ARM64 implemented. We would like to see ARM uh, at least uh, MIPS, x86-64, like to see those added to this structure. We'd like to do this for additional binary to types too. There's no reason why we have to inspect KL sims in a VM Linux. We could just inspect the exports um, section of an ELF file and patch an ELF file as well, right? So it'd be nice to be able to extend this architecture to do that. Um, expand the kernel text sections, that would be kind of nice to figure out, you know, instead of clobbering functions, can we uh, expand that text section ourselves and fix up some of the offsets and the addresses in the kernel itself to allow us to have more room or jump somewhere else that we need. Um, how this happened, here's a bunch of those FRAC articles uh, that uh, outlined uh, some of the research that we did beforehand. Uh, the very last one, effectively bypassing came pouring or restrict on Android. Was, uh, is a good article showing uh, an example of an ARM script for KL sims, for finding KL sims through Python. So um, just some, some good resources there. So that's what we put together. Uh, we're, the Patrick system allows you to modify kernel binaries without needing the OEM source or a particular tool chain. Uh, the source code, all the source code and everything you saw, including the examples, are on our GitHub page at github.batel slash patchwork. We have some readme sample patches. 
we're on Twitter, we're available um, for general contact or whatever. So that's it. Is there any questions? Yeah. How often is the board available? I'm sorry, what? How often are dwarf data sections available? There is no dwarf in the actual kernel itself. It, question was how often is dwarf available? A uh, dwarf is not in the actual kernel binary itself under From ARM64. Vengers. On what? From vendors. None that I'm aware of. Or that we've seen, yeah, 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 and especially when you're talking IoT, we, we're, we all have our, yeah, we all have our own little niches of what we can see out of this picture, right? Thank you for that. Anything else? Thanks for attending the last talk of the con in the building.